Great to be here in the house of God. Amen. We're going to be starting a new series tonight. Um, and the series is going to be looking uh, at possibly one of my favorite books of the Bible, which is uh, the book of Ruth. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, there's only four chapters in the book. You can read it in one sitting. It won't take you long at all. Um, if you haven't read the book of Ruth, then I've just given you a gift. Amen. You can go home and read that and be blessed. Uh, but over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the different chapters uh, uh, of the book of Ruth and understanding and, and getting revelation from there and uh, allowing God to help us. Uh, and the reason I love the book of Ruth, it's one of my favorites, is because it's a wonderful evidence of God involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of life. Uh, it's a wonderful evidence of God's provision, God's uh, sovereign hand, how he is uh, in complete control over everything. Uh, and he literally uh, orchestrates things and puts things together uh, for the good of his will. It's a fantastic story, a uh, fa fantastic account. Uh, um, and we're going to look at a few things. Uh, uh, it's, it's set in a time at the very beginning of the book. It says uh, the days when the judges ruled. So it's set in a time when there was no king in Israel and judges ruled. And all you've got to do is look at the book of Judges to see how messed up Israel was in those days. They had times of idol worship. They had times of victory. They had times of low. They had times of oppression. They had times of freedom. It was up and down. Um, so you can see the time frame of what it was set and what this all meant. But in the book, there's three main characters. Uh, there's Naomi, um, who I happen to name my first daughter after, amen. Um, uh, he, she was married to a man named Eliminek. Um, he was a man from Bethlehem in Judah. And they had two sons together, Marlon and Chilion. Um, the second main character is Ruth, obviously who the book is named after. This is Naomi's daughter-in-law. She was married to one of their sons. I don't know if it was Marlon or Chilion. The Bible doesn't let us know, but she was married to one of them along with Orpah, another Moabitess woman. There was two from Moab, which is where these people journeyed to. And then we have Boaz, who is an Israelite land owner. So we're going to look at that over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a blessing. God's going to speak to us, no doubt, through his word as we contemplate contemplate uh, uh, this series, and the series is called uh, Raising the Roof, amen, amen. all right now, um, and as a kickstart of this particular message, we're going to be looking at the first chapter of Ruth, but as I consider the first chapter of Ruth, uh, um, I started uh, thinking about something I heard about a long time ago, maybe I was in secondary school, I didn't really know what it meant, uh, but this was a, it's a, it's a legal agreement or it's a legal document. It's called a, a prenuptial agreement. Who's ever heard of that before? Prenup, they call it a prenup. Prenuptial agreement. Now, what this is, this is an agreement uh, bef between a couple before they get married. That's, that's the essence. It's before they get married uh, and they kind of break down and discuss what will happen when we break up. Okay, sorry. Okay, if we break up. <laughs> now, if you have one of these, you're married, you have one of these, listen, I'm not trying to step on your toes, okay? I'm just saying. I'm just saying how it is, right? This is what happens. So the whole point of a prenup is to make an agreement should in case we get divorced. And the prenup is like, it involves everything. It starts to say things like, listen, before we came to this marriage, I had two properties, you had zero so if, we, if something happens, listen, those properties are mine. <laughs> the prenup says, listen, when we came, you had 10,000 pounds of debt. I had none. So if the bailiffs come, listen, they ain't coming for me. They're coming for you. The prenup says, uh, listen, okay, uh, you know, I've been working. Uh, uh, you haven't been working. Uh, you know, I've been getting promotions at work. You haven't. So when it comes to if we break up, listen, the money can't really be 50% yours because I worked for it and you didn't. 
This is what the prenup does. It, it starts to build in clauses and uh, 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 little, little break, get out of jail free cards if uh, the worst should happen. And they try and uh, say it as if, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess by the way I'm speaking, you know that I don't necessarily agree with a prenup, right? They're, they're saying it as if, why, you know, it's a good thing to have. I saw articles that says why the prenup is going to be the best thing for your marriage. And they're, they're selling it as uh, insurance. They're saying, listen, we don't want to break up, but just in case we do, I want to protect myself. And what it does, it it, uh, it encourages people to have separate things. So it says, listen, have a joint account, but make sure you have your account uh, and they have their account. uh, And my money is my money, your money is your money. And then we have a pot where we can kind of share and so on. We split things. Listen, the reason why I'm against the prenup, uh, you know, is because what it does, it reduces a marriage to a business agreement. This is like an we're together as an economic agreement. And if something happens, then we get to, you know, split. Listen, listen, marriage was designed. Jesus said, the two shall become one. He didn't put any clauses in there to say, and if something happened, then you can do this and don't. There was a time actually uh, in, uh, in the book of John where the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said, listen, can we, can we just divorce for any reason? And Jesus said, listen, have you not realized or have you not read that from the beginning, God made two to become one and no one should separate them? And then they said, well, why did Moses give us a, a certificate of divorce? And Jesus said, because you have hard hearts. It wasn't meant to be like that from the beginning. So now with the hard hearts, we come up with things like uh, prenups and prenuptial agreements and so on and so forth. Uh, And I said that because uh, it is a connection or or it is a document that's making room to break a connection that should only be broken by death. This agreement makes room to break on any situation and so on and so forth. So I want to talk today about something that society seems to be scared of, and that is commitment. I want to preach a sermon of entitled Conscious Commitment out of Ruth chapter 1. Let's read uh, Ruth chapter 1. We're going to start from verse number 11. But before we start, a bit of background of what's going on, because I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. A bit of background what's going on. We see Naomi and her husband Elimelech. They are in Bethlehem, two sons, Marlon and Chilion, and there is a famine in the land. Where they're living, there is no food. They are, uh, they're, they're wondering, there's an economic downturn, and they're wondering what to do. And then they decide to move to Moab because they understand or they think that Moab is where we're going to be blessed. Moab is where we're going to live our lives and be able to feed our family. So they up and leave. But in so doing, a tragedy happens and eliminate the husband dies. Uh, the two sons, they take wives from the land that they've moved to, Moab, Moabitess women, uh, and for 10 years they're married. But then after 10 years, the two sons, they also die. So now we have a widow, Naomi, and her two uh, daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, who are also widows. And they're in this land, and she is depressed. She's thinking, listen, I've lost my husband. I've lost my two sons, and now we're here. And she's trying to persuade now these girls, listen, I'm going to go back to where I belong or where I came from. You just do what you're doing. And this is where we pick up the story in verse number 11 of our text. It said, Naomi said... Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them to grow? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Verse number 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Verse number 15, and she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, and watch this, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall become my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death 
parts you and me. When she saw that she determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Amen. Uh, we're looking at conscious commitment. You know, I love uh, these verses of scripture we just read, and we're going to unpack some of those. But if you're here, or if you've been here in any of the weddings we have uh, had in this church, you know that we actually incorporate this very speech into the vows. It's so powerful because it's to do with somebody making a commitment that would stand the test of time. And I want to consider with you firstly uh, about the committed choice. You see, in in society today, uh, commitment can be feared. People can be fearful of commitment or making a solid commitment that lasts the test of time. For many different reasons, people uh, uh, start to think, if I commit to this, then what am I missing out on the other side? Or if I commit, you know, there's so many choices. We're spoiled for choices in this day and age. So it have, we have trouble committing or, or making one decision. You might have a problem saying, have I made the right decision? Or will I be missing out on something if I commit to this? And we have to understand that because of that, we have this kind of fear for commitment in the society we live in. And commitment should not be feared. It should be revered. Can you say amen in this place? Commitment should be something that we should chase after. And I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but commitment in relationships seems to be a real issue in society today. Commitment to relating to one another. It's like, well, where has where this happened? And now we've come into this situation where people want to have the benefits of a committed relationship with no commitment. Come on, it's a, it's a slightly crude kind of saying, but I might say it anyway. There's a, something somebody used to tell me saying that sometimes men, they want to have the milk, but don't want to have the cow. Now, I'm not saying women are cows. I just hope you understand that. It's just an illustration. Eh? But what I'm saying is eh, there is a lack of a commitment. There's a lack of drive eh, to want to say, you know, I'm in this for the long haul. And that's how God designed designed it to have commitment. God designed relationships to work with commitment that should not be wavered. I'm tired of seeing relationships for years. You see now we have this cohabitation relationship where now a man and a woman, well actually anything goes nowadays, but let's just stick with man and woman for now for the time being. A man and woman will dwell together for a number of years. You've got grown old crusty men talking about this is my girlfriend. He's like, bro. <laughs> girlfriend. It's like, it's like you're in school. G- this is my girlfriend. And now because that sounds so weak and so weird, we've now uh, used this word which my, my parents hated. This is my partner. <laughs> Makes it sound a little bit more grown up. <laughs> No, 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 that's just somebody that you're just trying to shack up with. And we're saying, listen, we're doing all the things. We're putting named houses in each other's names. We're doing bills and so on, but get married, make a commitment that says, I'm going to be with you until I breathe my last. I don't want to do that. Where's the commitment gone? And, and listen, I know, ladies, listen, I listen. And it, it usually sometimes, I mean, something happens to reverse, but usually speaking, generally speaking, uh, uh, it is uh, the lady would have to kind of like, like just reduce her morals. In, in her mind, she's like, yeah, I want, you know, they've been dreaming about a, a white wedding since there was a child. Uh, but somewhere along the line, somebody has come in and slipped in and, uh, and has been able to kind of just, just move in. And now you're living together and stuff like that. And there's no commitment. Don't sell yourself so cheap. Come on, there should be a level of commitment. If you're willing to do some things, you're willing to uh, change a little bit. You know, a woman should be able to bring up a man and stand up to a certain level and say, listen, if you want to do this, uh, there has to be some rings involved. Can you say amen in this place? There has to be a level to say, I'm going to commit against everybody else to the exclusion of everybody else and, and say, listen, I'm here until I breathe my last. But what that does, what cohabitation does, uh, it allows me to keep my options open. Come on. (laughs) It's a bit quiet in here today. (laughs) I don't mind quietness. It's all right. It allows people to keep options open. Because if I lock myself down, then that means I can't choose her if I'm vexed with you. Dear Lord, it is very quiet in here. All right. (laughs) <laughs> I've not even looked at my notes yet. This, all I'm saying is not even my notes yet. I, I, Holy Spirit, let it happen. Let it drop. 
Because what it does, it says, you know what, you know, I, I, just in case, I want to make room for my exit plan. I want to make room that I can say, you know what, I knew I was right. I'm so glad I didn't marry you because now you're all funky. I can get to leave. But what commitment does, it says, it says regardless of the funkiness, I'm here. <laughs> that's what commitment does. And that's why people are afraid of it. That's why people say, oh, marriage is just a piece of paper. No, no, it isn't, bro. <laughs> if it was, just do it then. <laughs> just a piece of paper. Just get it. No, because marriage is, marriage is a lot more than that. The paper signifies weight. What you're saying, when I, signed that, when I signed on my marriage certificate, which we still have, I was signing to say, listen, I'm going to be here when we've got money in the bank. I'm going to be here when we're scratching our heads trying to feed our family. I'm going to be here when we've got Rosie and it's a honeymoon period. I'm also going to be here when we're fighting, throwing frying pans at each other. We don't do that in our house, by the way. Amen. <laughs> but I'm going to be here. That's what, that when I signed, that's what I was saying. And so it, it becomes, a, it becomes a, a place for fearfulness. And generally speaking, you know, people are, are understanding that before commitment, there has to be a choice. You know, the journey we live on, or the journey we're in called life, is filled with a variety of choices. And feeling is different because there comes a point where feeling must produce action. You know, I feel a certain way. Well, there has to be some action uh, uh, out of this. You know, in our text, in verse number 14, it says, uh, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. You know, they all felt bad for what was happening. They felt bad for the issues. Uh, but both of them, you know, both of them felt a certain type of way. Uh, but they had to make a choice. Uh, and we see that both of these women made different choices and I want to look with you about the committed choice because a committed choice can be as a result of other choices you know Naomi and Eliminek they made some choices in their life they decided yeah, we're going to move from here and go here and we're going to try and see what God is going to do in our lives and as a result of their choice Ruth and Orpah had to make some choices of their own. Look at verse number six of our text in Ruth 1. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, and she, sorry, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was, her and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And look at this, it says, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house, and the Lord dealt kindly with you as he has dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may be fine rest of each in the house of her husband. So because of the choice that Naomi made, now Ruth and Orpah are forced into making a choice of their own. Because of the people that Ruth and Orpah were connected to, they had to make choices of their own. You see, because a committed choice can come as a result of a choice that's happened previously. And they had to make a decision at that point. They were forced into it. It makes me realize that when you make a decision because of people you are connected to, sometimes you're going to have to make that because of the choices other people made. Maybe your family have moved you to another country. Well, now you're going to have to make a choice. Are you going to still keep your love for Jesus Christ or are you going to assimilate into the new culture you've now moved into? You're going to have to make a choice as a result of somebody else's choice. A committed choice can also be contrary to what others choose. Look at this in verse number 14. It says, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and left. It doesn't say that, but that's what she did. She left. But Ruth clung to her. A committed choice can cause you to stand when others decide to leave. You know, if you make a choice and it is a committed choice, sometimes you do that in the face of people making choices that are opposite to yours. And that can have an effect on your commitment. That can have an effect on what you're going to do. Sometimes you're going to have to look at people, look at what they've done and still stick with the choice that you've made. 
Come on, when we, we celebrated Easter this weekend, we partook of the Lord's Supper. And in John 6, uh, uh, Jesus was describing to all that was listening um, that very principle. He said, listen, you're going to have to eat uh, my flesh and drink my blood. And as he said that, it was such a hard saying. And we see here in John 6 uh, and verse number 66, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away also? You know, if you're making a commitment, sometimes you have to shun what other people are doing. Listen, I know you're doing that. You're living your life a certain way. But me, I'm going to make a decision and I'm just going to stick with it. I have principles I'm going to live with. In our walk with Christ, we have to understand many times genuine committed choices to follow Christ would mean that you're going to have to do something that other people are not willing to do. When you make a commitment, you're saying in exclusion of others, I'm going to stand by this. You know, if you are a young man or woman and you're deciding to follow Jesus Christ in university, there's going to be some decisions you're going to have to make that other people are not willing to do. There's things you're going to have to do. There's places you're going to have to say, I'm not going to go. There's practices you're going to have to say, I'm not going to do because you've made a commitment to Christ. You know, deciding to handle sexual relationships right means you're going to have to make some committed choices that other people are not going to make. You're going to have to make some decisions about where you live, who you live with, how you live, that other people that will start to call you crazy for doing so. Why? Because you've made a committed choice to follow Christ. Look at Matthew 7, verse number 13, familiar portion of Scripture. The Bible says, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many, there's loads of people that go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. You know, that's how it feels sometimes when you make a committed choice. Sometimes it just feels you're on your own on this path. Well, Jesus said, well, that's because the path is narrow. And a lot of people are going the easier way. You know, when you make a committed choice, sometimes it's going to be contrary to what others choose. When you make a committed choice, uh, it's also going to be tested. Look at verse number 15 of our text. It says, Naomi looked and said to her sister, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. In other words, you said you're going to stick with me. You're going to cling with me. But look, your sister has left. You ain't got no friends where we're going. Are you sure you want to do this? Listen, when you make a a committed uh, decision, especially when you want to follow Jesus Christ, many times I've seen it in my life, I've seen it in people that get saved. They make a decision to do something for God. They make a decision to say, I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to give, I'm going to do something. And shortly after, that choice is tested. Oh, you're going to stop drinking, are you? Okay. Cool. And all of a sudden, you get your friends who haven't called you in months. Hey, we're going out drinking. It's all on me. Come, let's go. Oh, you're going to stop chasing after the girlies. Okay, that's good. And all of a sudden, the people you've been chasing had no success for for years. All of a sudden, they start calling you, talking about, I'm lonely. Let's watch Netflix and chill. (laughs) Because when you make committed decisions, shortly after, that choice you made is going to be tested. That commitment you said oh, is going to be tested. The thing you said, I, I'm going to decide to do this. I'm going to go here. I'm going to cling is going to be tested. And we can look through the Bible as I've, I've picked out three men and they all begin with J. First of all, there's Job. Job, we understand, uh, uh, is, a, is a fantastic book of the Bible and it gives us insight to the spiritual realm and how that can affect our lives. Well, Job lost everything. Job lost everything, but he still had a committed choice to follow God. Even his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, his commitment was tested. Oh, it was tested, but he stood the test of time. And the Bible lets us know that he was blessed even after the test, even more than he had to begin with. Then we go to another J. His name is Joseph. 
You know, Joseph, there's many things in his life I can pick out, but the one that stands out to me is when he goes as a, a slave uh, in, in, a, in, his ma- in his master's house, Potiphar's house. He's working there, and he has his master's wife, the Bible says, day after day, was chasing after him, saying, lie with me. Day after day, what was she doing? What she was doing was testing his commitment. That's what he was doing. Some of you, listen, that happens to you as you go to work. As you, someone's going to be trying to test your commitment. Listen, we had uh, 27 people baptized on Sunday. What a blessing. Can you say amen in this place? Uh, they're saying, I have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Well, can I tell you, baptizee, that choice is going to be tested. Dare I say, it's, a, it's only Wednesday. Dare I say, it's been tested already. Come on, as we go through, make decisions. Someone somewhere is going to send you a test to see. Let's see how committed you are. And of course, we see Jesus. Even Jesus Christ, the devil tries his hand with Jesus just to test. Obviously, he's speaking to the human side of Jesus. We understand Jesus is fully God and fully human at the same time. You know, your mind might not be able to comprehend that that dynamic, but it is true. And the devil was appealing to his human side, trying to see how committed are you? I mean, he was in the wilderness 40 days and the devil was bringing out things and trying to tempt him and so on just to test the the commitment. I want to move slightly on as we talk about commitment to making conscious or conscious commitment. So commitment, we understand, costs. And as we go through our scripture, we can learn from Ruth using the list of statements that she made, uh, that she counted the cost. She understood what she was getting herself into and decided to continue on anyway. You know, commitment isn't blind. Commitment doesn't say, okay, I'm going to commit, but didn't know that this was going to happen. No, commitment fully understands the cost, fully understands what you're about to be embarked on and still commits anyway. Listen, when I got married uh, uh, almost 15 years ago now, when I was standing before friends and family and God himself uh, saying that I will, I do, and all of this, uh, I wasn't naive. I, was, I knew that this was going to be a testing time. I knew this was going to be uh, work involved. I knew that, but in spite of that, I wanted to commit anyway. And what a blessing it has been. Can you say amen in this place? Amen. Come on, because commitment counts the cost uh, and still continues to commit anyway. Look at verse number 16. We're going to look at the, the, uh, the statements that Ruth said. The first one she says, wherever you go, I will go. You know what that says to me uh, is that this is a commitment that doesn't have conditions. She didn't say, listen, if you go back to Bethlehem, I'm going to go with you. Uh, but if you go down somewhere else, nah, I'm not going with you. Nah, nah. If you, if you make a decision to take a right, no, I can't do that. No, she says, wherever it is you go, I'm going to be there right with you. There was no conditions. There was nothing to say if this happens or God, I'm going to serve you so long as you give me a husband. No, there was, no, there was, no, there was nothing like that. God, I'm going to serve you so long as you break through financially. Listen, there's some things that you're praying for. There's some things you're believing God for and you need to continue. But can I say to you, if God never gave you that thing, would you still be committed to him? There's no conditions in commitment. She said, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Look at the next one. It says, wherever you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Lodging is to do with dwelling. Lodging is to do with uh, uh, lifting, uprooting, and uh, and putting somewhere else and calling it home. Listen, she is not from Bethlehem. She doesn't know the Israelites. She is from Moab. All that she knows is the people in Moab. She has family in Moab. She has friends in Moab. She could have businesses. I don't know. The Bible doesn't let us know her, her life story. But she's saying, wherever you dwell, wherever you set up shop, I am going to do the same right there. God, if you call me to a city in Hull, I'm going to call that home. Can you say amen in this place? God, if you call me to be a missionary in China, in Botswana, listen, I'm going to go there. Wherever you dwell, wherever you lodge, I'm going to make my dwelling there. Come on, that's commitment. She says this, your people shall be my people. Come on, that's all about culture and identity. 
Listen, I love culture. I love culture. It was just the other day I was speaking, saying, yeah, I'm sad. I never learned my mother, my mother tongue. I, I, I can't speak the language uh, where, where my parents were born. Um, you know, I love culture. I love the fact, the Ghanaian culture. I love the food. I love the music. I love the, all these things and so on. But uh, uh, one thing I never let culture do is supersede the culture of God. Come on, you could tell me, I could go back to some village in Ghana, tell them, listen, this is, you have to do this, and this, you have to do this, you have to take this, but absolutely not. Don't care who you are, you could be the chief of the village. Listen, my people now, if it comes, uh, I have to change my people because you are doing something silly. Listen, you better believe I'm going to do that. I'm going to change because some people can sometimes, listen, lift up culture and elevate culture as if uh, this is now a standard I must die by. no. It doesn't match up with the word of God. Sorry, I love you, but I'm not involved. Ruth said, your people shall be my people. I'm going to swap everything I know and become part of the family of God. And she says this next. It says, your God shall be my God. And there it's just plain and simple saying, listen, I'm going to serve you. Before Naomi said, listen, Orpah has gone back to what she's known, gone back to her, uh, her, her household. And it also says, gone back to her gods. Ruth had seen, because I find it interesting, in the years she had seen Naomi, she had seen something different in Naomi. Come on, those years she's seen her mother-in-law function and work and pray and serve. She said, this is different. I've not seen it. The statue my friends used to pray for, we never seen the life that Naomi has in her. Listen, I'm going to swap the dead and come and follow someone that is alive. She said, your God is going to be my God. I'm going to swap everything I used to be about and give myself to you. And how long is that going to last for? It's found in verse number 17. It says, where you die. I will die and there I will be buried. This is supposed to last forever. And I say all of this uh, from this wonderful book uh, of Ruth. This is the first chapter talking about commitment because uh, in order to serve Christ, uh, you need to have a Ruth-like commitment. Come on, in order to be a, a son or daughter of God, you need to have the commitment that Ruth displayed. You need to say some of these statements despite what other people are going to say about you. You need to stand on these words despite what society will actually say about you. We need to stand up and be followers of Christ when having a commitment that is unshakable, a commitment that joins us. You know, I find it funny, interesting. I always say it in ways weddings that the marriage is just a picture of what Jesus Christ is coming to do with his church he is coming we are the bride he is the bridegroom so that means that two shall become one we're going to enter into a committed relationship I love this in Luke chapter 9 verse number 23 he said to them all if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me in other words, you should take up your commitment and continue it daily. We should live our lives in a committed fashion, in the good times and in the bad times. When we're up on the mountaintops or when we're down in the valleys, we should have a committed relationship with Jesus Christ. In this place, listen, we need to learn from what Ruth displayed as she was speaking to Naomi. We should implement this in our lives. And as we do that, as we're going to see in the next coming weeks, as we look at the other chapters of Ruth, listen, destiny will unfold as we make committed choices. Can you say amen in this place? I almost want to jump forward, but we're going to pause. We're going to see destiny literally is in the midst of as we make choices that's going to be shook by nothing or no one. As we make committed decisions, let's no longer fear commitment. Let's not fear fear uh, saying, listen, I'm going to make this my house. I'm going to draw the line in the sand. I'm going to make some decisions and live by them until I die. Let's not fear those. Let's revere those. And as we do that, as we live that way, I really do believe that God's uh, uh, hand
hand will continue to show us wonderful, great and mighty things in our life. He is the great orchestrator and he works with committed men and women. We're looking today, or we're looking these weeks at the book of Ruth. Today we're talking about a conscious commitment. Let's be committed men and women and allow God to use our lives. Would you agree with that in this place? Come on, let's give God praise one, one more time as we pray in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's bow our heads. Let's uh, close our eyes tonight to conscious commitment.